and welcome to the AIPMM webinar series. This is Cindy F. Solomon, your moderator, and I'm delighted to be with you today. Today, our speaker is Laura Lee Rose, who is a time management and efficiency coach. The AIPMM is the Association of International Product Marketing and Management. And today, we are talking about the art of war for product managers. The AIPMM was founded in 1998, and it is the largest international product management professional group, providing professional development, certification, and career advancement credentials, including the Certified Product Manager, CPM, Certified Product Marketing Manager, CPMM, Agile Certified Product Manager, a CPM and the Certified Innovation Leader, CIL. You can follow the AIPMM on Twitter, at AIPMM, and they post opportunities for product professionals from all over the world. So if you follow them on Twitter, you will see job postings um, multiple times a day and follow them on the web at www.aipmm.com where you can get detailed information about upcoming trainings, certifications, and membership discounts and opportunities. I am Cindy F. Solomon. I am delighted to be your moderator for this series. I founded the Global Product Management Talk, which is a weekly broadcast on Mondays and a top 10 business podcast on the Blog Talk Radio Network. It's at blogtalkradio.com slash P-R-O-D-M-G-M-T-T-A-L-K. Also, go to startupproduct.com to find out how to join the startup product movement for product excellence. I'm delighted to present to you Laura Lee Rose, who is a business process and efficiency coach. Her site is at www.lauraleerose.com. Uh, she posts excellent information and in-depth methodologies frameworks and steps to what I consider excellence in your professional um, careers, uh, in, in your professional endeavors. Follow her on Twitter at Laura underscore Lee underscore Rose. And she also is a business coach. She'll tell you more about what her, um, she offers. And I'm excited to have her today. Thank you. Hi. So, yeah, let me just uh, give them some housekeeping. So keep your chat box open. Um, use the questions box to post questions, which I will be reviewing and discussing with Laura for the answers. And there is an opportunity to win it for the participants who are the most active. You will be entered into a raffle. And we'll announce the winner at the end of the session. And Laura will tell you more about the IT Professional Development Toolkit that is available. And she calls it an IT Professional Development Toolkit. And let me tell you, it is relevant to all professional, um, technical professional managers, as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Cindy. Am I up? Yes. Okay. And so take it away, Laura. Thanks, Cindy, and I want to appreciate everybody's time today. A little bit about myself. I kind of grew up in the software development industry. I started as a developer and a programmer, and I moved into the testing arena and the quality assurance arena, and then I became a manager of both developers and testers. And while I was in that spot, I developed a customer advocate program called the design partner program in which we got uh, customers into our design meetings. They reviewed our requirements, they reviewed our design docs, they reviewed our prototypes, our demos. We had um, milestones for early delivery to these people very often through our product cycle. And uh, that really increased the quality, not only the quality of our product, but we were able to release the exact product that the people were going to be using uh, instead of the product we thought we were designing. So that led me into product and project management roles. And uh, through that 
background, I actually have five patents uh, to my name. I did a one process patent, which you can do a business process patent and, and invent that. And then I also did four product feature patents. So we can also, as product managers, invent and create and innovate our own uh, inventions. Uh, I now use that background in my business and efficiency coaching business. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching as well as group coaching. I do seminars such as this and webinars. And I'm also an author. I write many different um, articles and uh, I have a book called Time Peace, Making Peace with Time, and that, you'll see that on the next slide. You can purchase it uh, via Amazon. And also the toolkit that Cindy was talking about, the IT Professional Development Toolkit, I agree. It's, it's really professional development um, in branding of you, how you want to take your professional uh, career forward. That's releasing in May and it's being put out by the bits on the wire group. If you need some um, additional information or contact me, you can email me at laurarose at rosecoaching.info or just look at my website at www.laurarose.com. Okay. The next slide is the art of war for product managers. Uh, I took this from Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a practical philosopher who wrote the book um, Art of War in about 500 BC. So that's quite a while ago. But still his strategy, it really works today. In 2001, Gerald Michelson translated it for the business world and he titled his book The Art of War for Managers. And I borrowed both from Sun Tzu and Gerald and uh, brought it into the, well, the realm of high performing product managers project manager or any type of professional because these same fundamental principles really define our best. So Sun Tzu has about 50 strategies and he, he breaks them up into 13 categories and of course we're not going to have time to go through all of them. We might hit the first three or four categories uh, but we'll do the best we can with the time that we have. Uh, the focus of today's discussion, what I want to do uh, the next slide you'll see if you want to get a version of The Art of War. There's a free ebook version out there uh, and it is written in English. You don't have to know Chinese or Japanese to read it. Uh, it's in English and you can find it there. But the one thing I want everybody to take away from this meeting today is uh, we're all product managers, but the product we're working on today is you. You're the product. You, you, you're not trying to focus on the company product or your establishment, what the product is going out the door. The product that we're looking at today is you. What's your branding? What's your um, value? What's your unidentifiable uh, beneficial? What are you bringing to the company? So you want to product manage you. You are the product in this, in this talk that we're talking about today. So with that in mind, Art of War for Product Managers. We're going to talk in the next slide, we're going to be talking about uh, laying plans, waging wars, we're going to talk about strategic plans, and then if we have time, we'll talk about the employment of secret agents, which bubbles down to business networking. Okay? Uh, before we get going on the laying of plans, all plans have to have a purpose, goal, or intent. So this is where we come out and figure out, well, what defines a good product manager? What does a good product manager mean to you? So at this point, Cindy's going to do a poll to say, do you have a clearly defined definition of a good product manager? Not something that your establishment may have, but your own version of that definition. <laughs> And then while you're doing that, you know, if you have a great definition of what a good product manager means to you, what are your success criteria? What's your metric? Do you, uh, how do you know that you're on target? How do you know you're succeeding at being a good product manager? I'm going to pause here.
I like that Jeopardy music. So, Laura, can you see the poll results? I have. Um, I want to apologize to the group. I have uh, no internet connection. So if you hear some uh, strange comments like, on the next slide, you will see. It's because I'm <laughs> pretty much isolated. So, Okay, so let me tell you the poll results. Of uh, the seventy-five percent of the people voted, fifty-seven percent said yes. They do have a clear definition of what good product manager means to them, and forty-three percent said no. And as the votes were coming in, they were they were fluctuating. They were pretty uh, close to half and half. Well, I want to congratulate everyone that that voted in general. I really appreciate that that insight and input, and congratulations to the people that have taken the time to write, to have a clear definition in their head of what a good product manager means to them. And I hope the people that haven't, you know, may kind of consider maybe I should take the time to clearly define what it means to me and then take that extra step if we can to find some, some success criteria, some metrics of how do you measure yourself against your own definition, how you're doing a good it's job. Laura, so there was a question that came in saying, well, wouldn't it have been better to ask whether your company has a clear definition? Well, then that, in my opinion, that's putting the illness externally. I don't have influence. The, the, the most person that I have influence over is myself. If you think it's a good idea to have a product manager uh, mission statement, do it. Be proactive. Be proactive. Be proactive. I mean, if you think it's a good idea, don't wait for somebody else to tell you to do it. And this is an issue in many organizations that they have no idea what a product manager should be doing. So it is up to that individual to be educating the organization about what they should be doing and, and what kind of uh, support they need to be doing. Right. Take the initiative to, to bring it up with your 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 manager and with your HR because come performance time, if you don't have a criteria to meet, how do you know uh, your average rating or your below average rating or your above average rating? How do you know what you're going to be getting? So don't, don't leave it up to somebody else to manage your own career. Remember, the product that we're working on today is you. How can you succeed in this environment, regardless of external environments? Great. Okay. And the slide that I'm looking at right now is talking about a product manager mission statement. And I think it's a, a, along with that definition. Once you have a good definition of what a good product manager means to you, you know, define your own mission statement. So that you can use that as a navigation map, roadmap for yourself. And uh, like Cindy was saying, or that somebody that put that question in, or shouldn't the company come up with that? The you can certainly start off with your company's mission statement for a product manager. But on the next slide, you can see some of the other things that are more soft skills oriented that will make you a good product manager that may not be in uh, your company's uh, product definition. For instance, maybe you want to incorporate in your personal product management mission statement the idea of never compromise with honesty or beware of your effect on others or some of these other ideas that we have on the screen Are you, if you're seeing the screen. Maybe you want to make sure you keep a sense of humor about you. Maybe you want to realize that everything is in flux, everything is going to change and you want to be able to keep a sense of humor about you. BZ, uh, BZ and Cindy and I had this issue just 20 minutes before this uh, broadcast where my internet uh, came down. So we had to uh, scramble around just a little bit to find out another way to present this material to you. So everything is uh, in flux. So there may be some individual things that you want to add in your mission statement beyond the company's mission statement. Okay. So now we're moving into Sun Tzu's actual strategies of laying the plans. Um, 
Oh, one, one more thing about laying the plans. Before we start with the plan, you want to have an inventory of your resources and your tools. What does a product manager uh, rely on? What are their criti critical tools? You know, you may rely on your knowledge of the product that you're producing. You may rely on your organization skills, your scheduling and time management, your communication skills, your budget and cost estimation or forecasting, your risk management, your change management, all those types of skills. Um, but one of the, the most critical tools you may find is people. You can't get that product out the door without people. And that may be a little bit of an issue with some product managers and project managers because some of them don't have a staff. They have to borrow the staff and the resources from other managers. So that's where your communication and people skills, your negotiation skills come in um, into play. So, so Laura, you're, you're, uh, you're not talking about a startup where a, a product or project manager will be the only person um, responsible. Um, but I think this you are talking about all kinds of uh, products from regardless of software, hardware, or, or services. Yes. Um, there's a question regarding one of the soft skills that, about what do you mean by never compromise with honesty? Ah, I'll give you an example. Uh, for instance, we had um, a, a team that one of our metrics, one of our quality metrics was to have uh, zero defects in your queue by such and such a date. And this date was uh, six weeks before the end game, so it would give you plenty of time to uncover new defects and fix them. But the intent of the that quality metric was uh, in software development at least, we understand that any change in the software, any bug fixes or any change to the code has a risk of ten creating at least 10% new defects or uncovering defects. So the goal was at this point in time, have all your defects that have been fixed, retest them, and then, uh, and then while you're retesting them, you may find other defects, okay? This team had about 100 defects in their queue. Their goal was, their numeric goal was to have zero defects by the morning. And they thought, well, they're all fixed, so I'm just going to close them. And they closed them without retesting them. And that's, that's kind of compromising. You don't want to com compromise honesty. The honest thing would be to say, hey, you know, we have 100 defects in our queue. We can't possibly retest them. Can we extend this deadline? We can, we can retest them in three days. Can we extend the, the deadline? Instead, what they did was they, met, they tried to meet the numeric goal without, with bypassing the intent of the goal, and they closed all their defects. Great. So honesty, compromising the honesty is not trying to just focus on the task at hand, hitting those numbers, but really dig into the intent, the reason why we have this metric in the first place, and focus on accomplishing the, met, the, the intent, the goal, the reason for this metric, and not just the metric. That's one example. I hope that helps. Great. Okay. Um, moving through this, um, we have a laying of plans, thoroughly assessing conditions, compare attributes, and looking for strategic turns. We're going to go in through uh, thoroughly assessing conditions. Well, as a good product manager, a good assessment is really the foundation of what we do. Our role isn't really to control everything that happens, but to accurately determine what is happening. You know, effective product managers have to effectively and accurately and objectively assess the natural flow of their products. And I say objectively assess it because some of us fall in love with our product, and it's not always good 
to be totally in love with a product. We really have to objectively assess what's going on with it. That's the primary role of, of our product managers. And they just don't resist the flow. All products uh, have its natural flow, ups and downs, and it has a life cycle. And if we're not, how do I say, um, focused on the entire big picture, we may not see the end of life of our product coming. And we're, we're in charge of our own professional careers here, so if we, we, we're not seeing the end of life of our product coming and not positioning ourselves for our future, we may get caught in the, in the cracks somewhere. Okay. Uh, we're talking about meaningful metrics, we want to be, uh, that includes subjective and objective assessments, you know, getting that customer perspective involved into it, maybe pulling in customer early uh, focus groups, usability studies, and things like that. Um, let's see. And then also trying to find better ways to attract and retain your current uh, teams, your current sponsors, and your clients. And the best way is to uh, increase your quality and reduce that time to market. Okay. The next slide is talking about going beyond the obvious. Uh, one of the things that I want to focus here is focusing on the right important things. Most of, I, I, I'm sure most of the product managers out there realize that in the real world, our, only 36% of the product features are actually used by the end user. And then maybe you may have 100 features in your product, uh, but there's only 36%, approximately 36% of those features are actually going to be used by the end product. Oftentimes in big systems and big organizations, the person buying, purchasing that brand or that product is not the person actually using it. The person buying it for the organization may take a look at the technical consumer reports and say, okay, brand X has 100 features here and, and brand A only has 36 features, well, I'm going to buy brand X because it has 100 features um, checked off. But the end user, even though the end user only really uses those 36 features. So as a product manager, if you understand your client base and understand the feature set that the client and the end user is going to use, I can focus my time on the right important things and realize that not all features in my product are going to have equal quality, equal importance to the end user. For instance, even though I have to offer all 100 of these things, maybe 46 of them, they don't have to be automated. They probably can be accomplished with a manual or with a tutorial or with an on-site visit or setup or technical answer or something like that. And the 36 that the end user actually uses, I want to spend more time on uh, improving their requirements, getting the enhancements, understanding how the customer actually uses these 36 features so I can focus on the right important things. Okay, going through to the next one, compare attributes. A high performer actually understands how their contributions not only compare with others, but how it complements and completes the team. They also want to be able to understand how their contributions support the bottom line business goals. The company is in there to make money. So the better we can quantify our contributions in that goal of the business making money, the better it is going to be for us. And then to be a high performer in this industry, we want to help the entire organization. And the whole organization and the whole plan needs to be successful. I could be the best product manager in the world, but if my product isn't making money, I'm not going to, I'm not being very helpful to the organization. So those are some of the things that a high performer product manager wants to stay focused on. And they want to, as I was also mentioning, is you want to be adoptive of innovation as well in your personal development as well as in your, your product. The other thing that I find very helpful is that I hear a lot of 
uh, discussion and meetings about this should work like this, this should be this, if something should be done about this, this should be done, this is how it should work. And those should, 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 they rarely get converted into tangible action. So you want, you want, you want to do is take where you are right now and tweak it to, to what, what's going on now and tweak it to your next step instead of focusing on this should be doing it this way. A lot of times when somebody said this, you, this should be done this way, they're talking about somebody else should be doing it. So we want to identify what we can be doing right now to make an improvement. Okay. Uh, my next slide is saying looking for strategic turns. Okay. And high performers, they develop strategies that go beyond the conventional rules. Um, a solid performer might, might look and see the perceived confines of their assignments and they may wait for opportunities to pre be presented to them or to be assigned to them. But the high performer kind of creates the opportunities. And they take that step to separate the people from the problem and they focus on the interests, not the positions, to invent mutual gains. There are really a couple really good books out there. One is Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. That book is by Roger Fisher and Wilman Uri, U-R-Y. I recommend that as a good book. Uh, if you haven't read it or, or perused it, uh, take a look at it. Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreements Without Giving In. And it talks about instead of uh, collaborating, instead of compromising. And that's another thing about we were talking about compromising your honesty on that. This is a good book about that. And so high performers create situations which will contribute to the accomplishment of the plan. Uh, and then the other thing that I like to, to focus on is focusing on when we create opportunities, make opportunities from the inevitable. For instance, in software and software products, it's inevitable that software development is in my background, so you'll hear a lot of examples from the software industry. Um, but in software products, uh, problems are, are inevitable. You'll have a, a, a defect or or a issue that comes up like today, my internet was down. You're going to have some problems. So I'll focus on the serviceability of the product. Focus on maybe I, uh, we need to focus on some diagnostic tools or some better error messages so that there's a lot of er uh, pilot error or customer errors using this particular area of the product. Maybe my error messages need to be better so that the customers can troubleshoot it themselves. So take, create some opportunities from the things that you know are going to happen. The other thing that's going to happen is, especially in today's technology, is technology is going to change. So if I know that's going to happen and I know it's going to change quickly, maybe my focus isn't in my product is, the, is not just the serviceability but the sustainability of my product and how I can extend it so that its, it's life cycle is longer. It, it, it's, it lives a little bit longer in the, the market. So if I focus on sustainability and extensibility on my product, that may be a good, good uh, opportunity there. Okay. I'm now on the slide that says uh, waging war. We're going to be talking about marshalling adequate resources, which is a big factor in the product and project management realm where they don't have a lot of resources at their disposal. Make time your ally. Everyone must profit from victories and know your craft. Okay. Marshalling adequate resources. Uh, our resources range from hardware, people, time alloc allocation, budget, money, uh, even uh, client focus. How much time does the client have in that design uh, partner program I had to deal with, you know, the client's job isn't to get my product out the door, but the client's job is to get their work excuse me, their work out the door. So the, if I kept that in mind, the things that I was uh, showing the client, I wanted to make sure these demos and prototypes and uh, 
sample utilities that I'm showing the, the client, those, those utilities are actually helping my client get their work out the door. So things like that. I want to uh, have to juggle the immediate versus the, the future. I mean, I, pr I send out product uh, version one out the door and it gets released, I still have to maintain the, the technical issues, the maintenance cycle on product one version while I'm working on the, the next version two with a, a, you know, additional enhancements. So now I've got multiple branches to, to handle as a product manager and a project manager. So I have my current release of the product, the maintenance versions of that release, plus the next better version of that product. So I'm, I'm juggling those things. And then when do I prepare for the next technology? I have, I'm juggling this current product, but I know my product is going to have an end of life pretty soon. How do I prepare for the next big wave? You know, do I do the, the one thing to consider is your just-in-time training. You don't want to take training now for something that's going, that you're going to look at eight months from now. You want to make sure you do that just-in-time training, you know, in the right amount of advance notice so that when you get your training, you can use it right away. How do I do, how do I use this in my product being in you? Remember, this whole thing is also, I'm product managing a product at work, but I'm also product managing myself as a product. You incorporate it. You're the, you're the product here. Well, we're attending this seminar. We're doing a lot with Cindy's and, and her her blog talk radio show and this uh, presentation, what am I going to take away from this presentation and incorporate right now so I don't lose this information, I don't, I don't waste it? And same thing with individual plans, individual development plans. What are the, some of the things that I'm learning in these webinars and these seminars that I want to incorporate in my career development and individual development plans? So make use of it right now. Okay, adequate resources. Um, everyone, I'm at that, that slide that talks about investing adequate resources as everyone is a product manager per se because the product is you, right? And you want to manage this product that you're presenting to your family, to your friends, to your department, to the world. So uh, if everyone sees themselves as a product manager and a project manager, then you might want to train yourself. If your team understood what goes into product management and project management, they can help you out. If you, if you want them to do a certain report or a status report, if you do some training on how you want them to report their status, it takes a load off of you. If you um, present them with templates, and say, here are the templates, just fill it out, that's going to, and you train them how to use the templates, that's going to save you some time and you're, you're training them how to, to use these tools. Uh, maybe you're, you really admire your staff. They are really smart cookies, but they're always late in their delivery. Well, maybe it's not their skill set in the technical part of it. Maybe it's their estimation skills. They're, they're not very good at accurately estimating how long it's going to take them to uh, do this feature or do this product. Well, maybe train people, you know, have some certain training on how to do accurate estimating and do some practice sessions. And every time they're off their estimate, keep uh, a log of how many days they're off of the estimating so they can un incorporate that into their next estimating round. So, and then also assist everyone in understanding everybody else's motivations and, and um aspirations because the, the more you understand what makes the other person, the other people tick, the better it is for you in that people skills, in uh, getting everybody to, to work to your advantage. I'm on the slide that says B, make time your ally. And I use the acronym B, be effective and efficient. Uh, maybe there are certain things that you can automate or optimize. Maybe if you're always finding yourself doing reports and analyzing the reports, then maybe some, some way 
to optimize or automate it. Remember, just because a report was always done doesn't mean that it's a meaningful report. Take a look at what you're doing and say, are all of these things meaningful? What's the return on investment of my time doing these reports? Um, and then staying on top of the technology. One of the things that you know you may feel overwhelmed with is how do I stay on top of all of this technology? One thing is to get get in your mindset of networking. A lot of people that you see that seem to know everything and stay on top of things, their trick is that they don't really know everything. They have a network behind them. They can go to people to, to fill in those gaps so they don't feel obligated to be all things to all people. They just seem that way because they have a network of supporters behind them. They know who to go to for, for this skill set or for this gap so they don't feel obligated to be all things for all people, and that's going to, to put time on your time, on your side. The other thing that I want to to emphasize is to try to be uh, minimize your interruption driven activities. Uh, just because an email is popped into your your in basket doesn't mean you have to read it right away. Just because the phone is ringing right now doesn't mean it's an urgent telephone call. Uh, just because your chat system uh, system popped up with an instant message doesn't mean that you have to pay attention to it right now. So get in the habit of blocking do not disturb times in your office. Say if I want two hours to, to work, gain my uh, do not disturb hours for this week or Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 3 to, to 5 p.m. Or, or block out some of that time and publish it so that everybody understands, hey, if I'm, he's not responding to my email right now, oh, that's right, because it's his do not uh, disturb time. Put your do not disturb on your instant message uh, thing, on your telephone. You have those tools for a reason. Another thing that might help you with your email is to get in some type of, of convention where in your subject header, uh, train people that if you want my attention on X, Y, and Z, here's the subject uh, convention that we're going to use. The, the topic and the deadline. Say, review, review this requirement document by you know, Friday, March 3rd. And that way I can take a look at, at just looking at the headers and seeing what I need to accomplish when instead of taking the time to open every single um, email and then might miss the date and you send me a long email, I might miss the, the request to, to uh, send this back by March 3rd. But if you put it in, you know, have some type of convention in your subject line that will highlight what you really need to do and then you can immediately prioritize your, your calendar to uh, match what this request is without even opening the email right away. Uh, same thing with uh, optimizing your emails. You can do autoresponders. You can, uh, if you use the subject matter convention uh, routine, you can actually have your message rules look for these certain conventions and actually pop them into the proper folder without mucking up your, your in basket. And so then you might say, okay, on Thursdays, I, I'm going to be looking at all my reviews for X, Y, and Z. You already have a folder called reviews and on Thursday you just go to that, that folder and take a look at it. Okay? The next slide about uh, B, you know, make time your alley, it talks about shift happenings. Uh, shift happens. Things, the only constant thing that we have is change. So the better you can adjust and manage change, the better for you. Uh, the high performer really is an, an expert in adjusting with speed and accuracy. Uh, in Sun Tzu's book, they say the value in war is a quick victory, not a prolonged operation. So um, high performers are quick to turn a workable idea, idea into measurable and useful results for the organization. Uh, high performers typically begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind is one of the habits in Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. That's another book that I recommend reviewing or scanning. 
Uh, so when you go home or when, when you get away from this uh, seminar, identify what have I learned, how can I turn it into a workable, measurable, useful result for my organization. Not only my organization at the office, but for me as a as the product. Okay? I know we're kind of running out of time, so I'm going to uh, fast forward a little bit. One of the things, one more thing that I want to make important on this slide is reasonable forcing functions. Uh, I know some when you make external commitments to other people, you're more likely to achieve them. But even do that on your personal uh, goals. Uh, we were talking about this last time uh, the other day with Cindy. She was saying that you know she's great with external meetings with other people, but with commitments that she's made to herself, she kind of puts that on the back burner. But use that strategy of uh, reasonable forcing functions and, and an accountability partner. Make yourself accountable, accountable to somebody else, even if it's just your goal that you want to uh, accomplish A, B, and C task by Wednesday. Tell somebody else that you're going to be accomplishing that by Wednesday, and that gives you that accountability. Also, uh, if you want to be working on your career development plan, make a, a commitment, a, a forcing function that says, I'm going to, on my next one-on-one -on -one meeting with my manager, I'm going to present my career development plan to him or her. And that's a reasonable forcing function with an accountability partner. Okay, and the next slide, uh, I just want to emphasize Schedule the time. If it is important to you, take out your calendar, regardless of what tool you use, and put a date and time in the book to do this, in your calendar to do this. A lot of us make lists of to-do lists, and they don't, we don't have any deadlines or timelines on them, or we carry the to-do list in our heads. And that, is, that feels a burden. We're, we're heavy because we're carrying all this stuff that we have to do. If I stick it in the calendar and say, okay, I need to meet with Margaret. Don't, don't just say I need to meet with Margaret. Say I'm going to meet with Margaret on Friday at 2 o'clock. Stick it in your calendar and then you don't have to think about Margaret until Friday at 2 o'clock and that releases some of the things that, that you're carrying around in your, your head. I know we're kind of running out of time. Uh, how much more time do we have, Cindy? Uh, Ten minutes. Okay. Um, the other strong thing that uh, Sun Tzu emphasized in The Art of War is that a successful directive is where everyone wins. Uh, in Sun Tzu's scenario, he would defeat the enemy and they would, he would take, you know, other people would take their spoils and their chariots and then put them in prison. Uh, what he would do is add them to his own men. He would treat them right make them part of his, his force, make them part of his soldiers, as, as members of his soldiers. So he actually allowed everybody to win on that. So that's the same kind of thing that we want to incorporate in our product management. We want to create uh, partners versus adversarial uh, connections. If you, have, um, if you have somebody that you, you're not really jiving with, that you, that you have uh, difficult conversation with, with in the next meeting instead of sitting away from them or on opposite sides of the table, sit right next to them because uh, sitting on the, next, on the same side of the table and next to them, the whole atmosphere is that you're working on a problem together, you're collaborating, you're co-creating a solution. While sitting at opposite ends of the table, you still feel this adversarial us-them kind of stuff. So that's a really good trick. Um, mentally to get you right in the right mood for that win-win uh, strategic planning. And then attending meetings and conferences. Always materialize it into something tangible. Uh, if you're, you know, perhaps some of the things that you may come out of a meeting would be an, an FAQ or maybe a product press release or, or uh, contacting your clients with some of the added uh, information that you've learned, something like that. Maybe uh, you want to incorporate some of the things that you learned in your meeting at a trade show, show or a um, technical paper that you're going to be given or, or, um, or a webinar. So always try to convert something that you're, you know, that, that intangible into a tangible ROI. 
kind of issue. Know your craft. It's time to understand that to be a high performer, we really have to be a master in my uh, own craft. And we talked a little bit about uh, finding your, your unique benefit to your organization. Look at you, yourself, as the product. What is What differentiates yourself from the other product managers in your organization? Uh, what kind of branding, what kind of unique benefit do you give? And start marketing yourself like that. As, just as if you're the product, as, just as if you would product manage anything else, let's product manage ourselves. We talked a little bit about finding a hero. Sit down and, and visualize yourself 10 years from now. Sometimes uh, part of our limitation is our imagination. We don't take the time to say, where do I want to go? Where, where do I want to be in 10 years? And find that person that matches that 10-year description. Find that person that is already there, is already where you want to be. And ask him to be or her to be a mentor. Find out what their skill sets are. Find out uh, what uh, roadmap they use to get to where they are. And uh, use them to fill some of your expertise gaps. Okay. I also want to encourage people to seek out multiple uh, members and coaches. The, uh, your idea where you want to be in 10 years, maybe no one else has been there. Maybe you need to find the attributes of you know, person X for this area of where you want to be and another person for this. Maybe somebody is really good in the technical realm that you aspire to be just as technical as fluent in that area, but you want to have the same management skills and personal skills and marketing skills as person Y. Incorporate both, you know, be, uh, ask them, both of them to be your mentors. Okay? Uh, I'm going to move through this. Uh, Cindy's going to send out, or they're going to, they're going to put the, the slides in a shareable place so you can take a look at all of these at your leisure. So I'm going to um, move through this and uh, I'm going to go to the slide that says beware of high level dumb. Okay? Uh, and this one talks about avoid acting without full knowledge of the situation. High performers realize that they don't know everything about a particular situation. Even though they've been on top of it uh, for several months and they know the product inside and out, they acknowledge that there may be some things in the product line or how the, the customer envisions how to use the product. You know, they may have a real good idea of how the product is designed and how the company expects the product to be used, but they may not have a good perspective of how the end user is actually going to use the product. Um, so we want to make sure we acknowledge that number one, we're not going to have full knowledge of the entire situation, but we're going to make the best decision we can with the knowledge we have in front of us and accept the progressive refinement mentality. As more information comes in, we're going to improve and progress in that direction where that information is coming in. The only way to do this is learn to ask the right questions, ask open-ended questions. Um, and if you're not getting the information, like we had that question before, I said, well, isn't the company supposed to give me the product manager, uh, what's the definition of a good product manager? If you're not getting the information, you aggress aggressively take the initiative to get that information. If you're not getting, uh, if you're receiving ambiguous requirements, take the initiative to uh, clearly identify clear goals, clear requirements. Go out and talk to people. Get the information you need. Don't sit there and wait for the information to come to you. They, it may never come. So you go out and ask the right questions and get that, that information. Remember that the end, goal, the end goal is get a quality product out the door. It's not to, I got to wait, you know, the developers are supposed to send this information to me or the business analysts are supposed to get that, that information from the business analyst. Take the initiative like Cindy was saying. And, and create these opportunities for yourself. We talked about the, um, the problem about focusing on meeting the numbers with that tester example, so I won't go in that uh, again. So when we're going into disposition, disposition of military strength, 
Um, Sun Tzu talks about being invincible, attaining strategic support, superiority, and then use of information to focus our resources. So um, we're going to go through what, what I really want to go through is the next uh, slide which says attain, attain strategic superiority. And we're going to jump right down to the last thing about recovery protocols. We, we as good product managers, we understand about risk assessment and contingency plans and we want to juggle the, prior, the probability of something happening with the impact. If, if it's a high priority of happening but low impact, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. If it's a uh, low priority of happening but has a high impact, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. But if it's a high pri priority of happening and a high impact, then we're going to get our contingency plans in place. Same thing with the recovery protocol. Um, most, most products will hit some speed bumps and some delays in delivery. So if you get upfront commitment with the team on what I call recovery protocol, get them in the room and decide uh, what are, the, what are the steps? What are the steps we're going to do when we hit a speed bump? It's going to be a smooth sailing for you. It's like having, you don't want to wait for a fire to happen to decide on your fire escape plan. You want to have your fire escape plan known up front and have everybody on the same page with it so that when the fire does occur, you actually know what our next step is. So the next slide actually shows a recovery protocol example where, uh, and it's, you want to do it for each product. For instance, one product, maybe the last version of my product had low quality. Uh, we got a lot of customer complaints in it. And this is say, this example here. And, and the first thing, the, the, the last thing we're going to change is we really want to hit these criteria, quality criteria and this quality focus. We're not going to release this product unless it's at this stage of the game. So we're going to accept that as a non-movable, inflexible attribute. So what are my other attributes that I can play around with to get this product out the door? Well, maybe in this product release, I have a lot of resources that I can borrow from a sibling department to get this out. Or maybe I can outsource something to, to another organization. If I'm a one-man one -man team, maybe I can use an affiliate to, to subsidize some of the, the resources that I need. So maybe the first thing that I do is I can play around res with resources until it doesn't make sense to add any more resources to this because maybe at some point too many cooks in the kitchen doesn't make sense. So then after that doesn't make sense, then, then I agree that I'm going to modify the scope. Maybe I'm going to eliminate some of these features and the features that are left, I'm going to diminish some of the scope or the enhancements of those features. To, to make this product until I can't do that anymore, until uh, at some point there's a minimum part of the, the, the feature list that if I don't, if I do anything less, the customer's not going to buy it at all. So, you know, until it, maybe I'm going to change the scope until it doesn't make any sense to change it. And then the next thing I'm going to change is add time to the schedule to accommodate this because the thing that I'm not going to change is the quality criteria. So, um, how many people, we're going to pause here, how many people do something like this at the start of their, their uh, product planning? Is this a poll? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is the one, how many uh, do something similar to the recovery protocol? So do you have a recovery protocol method? Yes. It's just a yes, no question. Mm -hmm. Okay. It could be called something else. You may have a different name for it. Okay.
so uh, many people um, gave some more explanation, but only 23% have a recovery protocol method. 77% do not. And several people said, uh, we do, but sometimes, um, not all the time. And also, Laura, we have come to the end of the hour. Um, and so we do have to do the, the raffle for the winner. And um, more, the slides will be posted on the AIPMM website and on the AIPMM slide share. Um, shall we do the raffle and then you can do uh, a quick summary? That sounds great. Okay, so that's that's the slide to be on. Great. So the raffle. And there were a lot of great participation. So there's a lot of names to choose from. The winner is Mary Dros. Not sure how to pronounce your last name, Mary, but congratulations. You have won the IT Professional Development Toolkit. And Laura will uh, send you email um, about that. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, just a clarification. She's not going to win the toolkit. She can get a discount on it. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. So you have won the offer yeah. having to do with the professional development toolkit. Okay. Um, so... Oh, Laura, um, if people want to go deeper into it, you covered so much material and there was even more material. Um, where can people get access beyond the slides if they want to go deeper into this? And I know you, you've written a lot about these things as well. Yes. Um, if you can go to um, my, my website, www.laurelyrose.com. And go under resources and, and articles and uh, worksheets. So you'll be able to and find that. Or just email me with your specific question, and I can direct you specifically to, to the resource. And my email is laurarose at rosecoaching.info. Excellent. So thank you so much to the participants for joining us today. Um, uh, thank you, Laura, for this really excellent information. And I know that you had shared with me um, a, a piece that you wrote about the recovery plan. Yeah. Um, and so she has many PDFs um, that are available for download. Today's slides... If um, let me tell you about the coming attractions. Uh, next week's webinar series will be on becoming the social product manager with Ed Brill from IBM, who is the social product manager at IBM, talking about what's involved with that. And on Monday, on the Global Product Management Talk, our guest is Rich Marinoff, who joins us it's, uh, <laughs> every year. He's the founder of the biggest product camp and the first product camp, Silicon Valley, which is taking place on Saturday in San Jose. So I'll be talking with him about what transpired at the most recent product camp and uh, his plans for his next book and what he has seen uh, has occurred in the product management world over the past year. Has He's a uh, speaker and trainer um, that travels worldwide uh, talking about product management in startups and product management executive issues. So uh, thanks again. Follow the AIPMM LinkedIn company for information. Sign up for their newsletter. The and certification information is available on the website. These slides will be posted on the AIPMM site and also on the slide share. And I also post them on my slide share. Thanks again, Laura, for joining us. This is excellent information. I think we um, do. You actually do a two-hour webinar, or is or is this part of training? 
uh, trainings that you provide? Yes, yeah, so I have a two-hour webinar on this, and it's part of the IT Professional Toolkit. Ah, excellent. Okay, so definitely check out that IT Professional Toolkit. Uh, also, if anybody wants me to, to uh, talk at their organization, uh, we can talk about that as well. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you, attendees, for the great participation. Thank you, Laura, and thank you to the AIPMM. This is Cindy F. Solomon. Have a great week. And thanks, BZ Lewis, for our engineer. <laughs>